Well, I've been using the Stalif implant uh, in the lumbar spine for several years and have had uh, success with it uh, over several hundred cases. Um, I'm uh, a proponent of anterior uh, fixation and fusions, and I believe that the Stalif cage gives uh, a good degree of uh, standalone stability. The spine can be approached anteriorly, posteriorly, or from the side, or anterolaterally. The, the key reason I frequently use an anterior approach is because I'm able to put an implant over a large surface area of bone. Uh, the stay lift cage is designed to pretty much cover the entire surface of the vertebral end plate. And as compared to other approaches, I get a better fill against the bone. If you come from the back uh, posteriorly, you could never get as much end plate coverage or vertebral body coverage uh, because you can't retract the nerves well enough to do that. Even from a T-lift approach, you can't get this size cage in or the same type of uh, coverage of the vertebral body. Uh, a far lateral or transoas approach, you can get a pretty good size cage in but you don't get the front to back coverage. And then if you add in there the fixation screws that actually lag up into the bone and produce a compressive force, in my experience with an A-lift approach, I get a higher fusion rate, I get uh, less post-operative pain, quicker recovery, and I don't harm or damage the posterior muscles of the spine. In general, the lateral annulus is left intact as is generally the posterior annulus. So the posterior annulus and posterior longitudinal ligament are still intact. The anterior longitudinal ligament is excised with almost any anterior approach, but because these screws anchor down into the bone, they reproduce the uh, anterior lig ligament effect. So uh, you get good compression uh, because the vertebral bodies are under a little compressive force and you've reconstructed the anterior ligament complex basically with the screws so that prevents excessive uh, extension. So really, uh, and then in addition, the footprint of the implant allows for a complete fill of the disc space. This is a very, very stable biomechanical construct. Well, this is uh, an example of Th these are actually the uh, preoperative radiographs of one of the patients that we interviewed earlier today. It was the uh, nice uh, female patient, uh, SG, who I talked to in the office for a six-month post-op follow-up. And I wanted to show these x-rays because this shows the L4-5 disc and how tall it is naturally, and the L3-4 disc. These are healthy-appearing discs radiographically. This disc, the L5-S1 disc, is profoundly narrowed. It's essentially bone against bone with only a slight amount of cartilage here. When this happens and the disc space narrows, the neural foramen where the nerve comes out is compromised and it's made smaller. We showed these x-rays earlier when we were talking to uh, this patient on her six-month post-op follow-up and we showed how beautiful the fusion is both with bone in front, behind, and through the cage. But the other important point that I really want to bring out is that we've taken this narrow disc space that may be two or three millimeters tall and we've brought it back up to 12 millimeters tall which is equivalent to the disc height above and below. This was a 12 millimeter tall implant and now the vertebral end plates here and down here. So we've taken an implant, a disc space that was down to two or three millimeters and taken it back up to 12 millimeters. And by doing that, we've basically gotten an indirect decompression of the neural foramen. This is that same patient's preoperative MRI scan. And again, you can see that the lowest disc space is profoundly narrowed. And it has what we call modic end plate reactive changes, which are a sign of vertebral body inflammatory reaction usually seen around a degenerative disc. As this disc space has narrowed, you can actually see how there's a buckling of the anterior longitudinal ligament and anterior annulus uh, anteriorly, not so much posteriorly. 
but this is a sign of severe and advanced degenerative disc disease and in my experience is almost pathognomonic for mechanical back pain. Well, as, as you know, the Stalift C technology is relatively new. I've had an occasion to use it quite a few times um, and I found that it's uh, been an excellent implant uh, for standalone uh, treatment of uh, degenerative disc disease, cervical spondylosis with associated uh, cervical radiculopathy or myeloradiculopathy. This is uh, an ACDF procedure and the uh, construct of this implant is such that you have a large footprint cage filling up the disc space as you might with bone graft or other implants and then instead of using um, a plate which is outside the confines of the vertebral bodies the anchoring screws down into the bone make this uh, implant completely confined within the disc space. There are other low profile implants that I think also do a very good job and work well. Uh, the Stay Lift C is designed to be used with three screws. The other implant I'm familiar with uses two screws. As you tighten these screws down into the bone, they actually lag the implant under compressive force to the vertebral end plates, both superiorly and inferiorly. Technology uh, has a lot of potentials obviously uh, for anterior fixation. Also, um, the idea of compression fixation where screws are driven in an oblique fashion through the cage up into the vertebral end plates could be placed from an anterolateral or a direct lateral approach.